I've known Michael since he was a little kid. His parents are dear friends of ours. Michael's married to Katie Ann Chishin, has three delightful kids and lots of furry friends at his house. Uh, Mike loves education. He obtained his first degree in 1999, a Bachelor of Education, and teaching wasn't exactly perfect. He moved on to a Bachelor of Nursing, then on to um, a Master of Nursing in, 2000, in 2008, and it, that gives him, qualifies him as a nurse practitioner as well. The newest other educational um, endeavors that Michael's encountered, he's an ICU specialist, an ER specialist. He's constantly um, updating his education. Uh, in, Mike has done a lot of teaching, both with the University of Manitoba faculty and with the Athabasca University. Um, Michael returned after, after working in Winnipeg for many years. He returned to Kenora, thankfully, our gain in 2016, and began a new career in improving quality of, of life and relieving suffering in long-term care. He currently works as a nurse practitioner with Pinecrest and uh, Birchwood and continues his teaching at the university levels. Um, the Dr. Jim Beveridge uh, hospice unit really came about because of uh, Mike's tenacity and uh, perseverance in advocating for, for uh, a hospice in our, in our community. Michael's learned, earned many uh, awards for his contribution in nursing, and he brings a wonderful uh, blend of deep caring and passion to um, combined with his uh, great education. Kenora is so blessed to have him and you've really made it such a better place. Uh, without further ado, Mike is going to talk to us about palliative care, a subject that's dear to my heart. Uh, and part of that is MAID, which is medical assistance in dying and geriatrics, which is the care of the elder. Go ahead, Mike. Thank All you very yours. much. Is there a way you can allow me to be a presenter or to share that so okay. I can share my screen so I can show you the presentation? Sure. Feel as the hoodoo on that. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. Well, I uh, appreciate this a ton, you guys. It's an honor for me to talk to you guys today and in timing with the National Palliative Care Week. You know, we're here to uh, celebrate our achievements and also look at uh, opportunities for um, improvement and understanding. So um, I think in Kenora, we've been so fortunate and lucky to have uh, be doing these things. In terms of what I need to disclose, uh, basically I live here now. That's probably my biggest disclosure. Um, and I am involved in uh, end of life with palliative care. Um, what we need to win um, or consider a win and celebrate is, in terms of the first things that we can be talking about this week, is Bill 3. And you know the, the Minister of Health tabled or has to table this report by uh, this December of 2021 and basically is going to outline and do the research to say what is lacking in palliative care, how do we get everyone access to palliative care, and how do we support um, palliative care, hospice, long-term care, and hospital uh, palliative care services the best. So fortunately, and very excitingly, we're doing this. It is odd that I'm talking to you in 2021 about how we're gonna have a plan for palliative care when we've been dying since the beginning of time, but this is a good start. It's like when we talk about the environment and what we need to do now, we're sort of behind, uh, a little behind anyway. So again, it's super important that now that the, the government of Ontario is, um, has this bill that we can keep um, the province accountable for as, they, um, as they're helping us to do what we can do the best. So this is one of my favorite slides. So I know that for um, you would probably consider yourself on this couch getting the psychotherapy, but it is more for me than it is for you. Um, you know, I do frequent talks on how to achieve a good death um, and what that looks like and what a bad death looks like. And the more I talk about it, the more it, it helps me a lot in the things that I have to advocate for and the things that I do in our community. So thank you for that. Um, a little bit about me, just like um, Claire was mentioning, uh, my whole experience was in uh, acute and intensive care at Health Science Centre in Winnipeg, and I came to Kenora in 2016 and started working in long-term care. Um, and from going from curative care to palliative care and working with uh, 
my patients that mostly have a, a, a lifespan of approximately 18 months, it really changed my focus and my expertise and what I needed to try to figure out to try to do this the best that I could. There are unique challenges working in a tertiary care center um, at a major hospital to working in long-term care and doing palliative care hospice and made in rural Ontario. Um, but these are things that are all achievable and, atta and attainable. Um, and I'm excited to be here to try to, uh, to do those things. You know, uh, in uh, 2015, it was the government of Ontario that said, you know, the mandate and the, the initiative is to try to get nurse practitioners into long-term care, you know, and so for, there's lots of good reasons in terms of what we're trying to achieve um, in terms of decreasing hospital transfer. But the biggest thing that I didn't realize and that was going to come to the forefront was the end of life care and the palliative care that was the, um, I would say, the biggest epidemic um, in this area and what it means and, and how we can um, change the course of what is happening to people from someone being in the building Monday to Friday. So I'm very honored that my physician colleagues um, um, uh, help me in terms of the supportive feedback they give me in my role. Um, and I say to them, you know, the changes that we've made, it's not because of me, it's because there is someone regularly in the building Monday to Friday that can handle the needs of all of the things that are happening. Um, telephone medicine in terms of what normally um, governs long-term care and recognizing early palliative care and um, providing acute on chronic care is what gets missed. Um, and so what COVID has greatly shown us and with all the things that have happened in our country so far and with Bill 3, hopefully this is the tsunami of things that can help further um, funding uh, for these areas and increase um, human resources in these areas. You know, I just wanted to quickly touch on you know, what I do um, at, in long-term care is um, what we know in long-term care is that death is expected, um, which is very different from a hospital setting or an emergency room setting. Um, this is where we do care for the living and the dying. Um, but unfortunately, most people here are over the age of 85 with multiple comorbidities a dementia plays a huge role and same with frailty. And what happens is that still a third of people die in hospital. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can align our goals of care and what we can do in terms of our expressions of values that try to make this a little bit better and easier for us in terms of what's expected. Um, just very briefly, I'm gonna stop uh, talking about just long-term care, but it does apply to um, sort of all of us in terms of the lifespan, in terms of the bigger general sweeping um, things that I'm going to discuss. So in terms of what does this mean or what happens uh, typically in long-term care, again, these are things that are um, that we are pushing for in terms of changing the system. But in terms of it applies to us with all of us that get a diagnosis of any type of life-limiting illness and the things that we worry about or things that don't happen well for us in terms of what we don't understand about unnecessary hospitalizations and thinking that everything and doing everything for us is the best thing possible. So typically communication is not adequate um, and decisions are made because of a single issue rather than what's happening with overall health. And I'll explain that as we go. So what evidence shows, and this is what's key, that we do better when we understand the prognosis. And we do better when we have open dialogue. And this is what helps align us when we're looking at, and I wanna quote, um, for us to achieve a good death or a more peaceful death. So what do families want and what do they say? Well, they want good symptom control. They want people who care. They want discussions before there's crisis and they wanna not feel guilty about decisions they have to make into the future. So I don't want this slide to be confusing, but the top two uh, squares where it looks at sudden death and terminal illness, 
in relation to function, if you look at, of course, if we were to, heaven forbid, something was to happen to us right now in terms of our functioning, um, when in terms of sudden death and terminal illness, when you look at the time between death from high functioning, how quickly that changes and how really we, it's difficult to plan for that. But for most of us, as the future progresses, we will experience some kind of end organ failure, whether that's our heart or whether that's our lungs or whether that's kidneys or whether that's dementia. And that course changes quite dramatically in terms of low functioning and keeping at a state of low functioning for a longer period of time. So again, that is important in terms of our discussions about talking about what are our goals? Are our goals to prolong our life with very poor level of functioning or to increase our quality of life with the time that we have. I was really fortunate when I first started here to attend a palliative care conference in Winnipeg. Um, I was able to network and meeting uh, the medical director for the hospice and palliative care for Manitoba um, and the unit at St. Boniface, uh, that being Dr. Mike Harlos. Um, in this role, it's always important to network with as many specialists that you can and people uh, providing services in multiple different areas to see how can we can make how can we can make things better at this moment and what we can do um, right now. Part of that conference was I met um, another nurse practitioner, Prishna, uh, Chris, uh, Prisha Pritha Krishnan. Um, who gave this presentation on uh, evidence-informed end-of-life care to achieve a good death in nursing homes. I thought, holy, what a provocative title. Um, what does a good death mean and, and how do we try to achieve that? Um, you know, you look at, um, I reflect back on my experience in working at Health Science Center, being on a cold blue team um, and working in going from the emergency room to the intensive care unit when end of life perhaps isn't expected. And now when end of life is expected and what that means and how we can align our goals to uh, help us to relieve some of that um, suffering. So again, a good death is one that is free from available distress and suffering for patients and families and caregivers, but in accord with our wishes that are reasonably consistent with our clinical, cultural, and ethical standards. That's well, a huge statement, and what does that mean? Well, in terms of trying to understand that, that helps us with our understanding and acceptance as things start to change, and I'll get into that. So how would I define and how could you define palliative care, and what does that mean? If you look at the graph at the bottom, where it's got the diagonal line of disease modifying curative versus um, and underneath it, symptom management and palliative. Well, that's all palliative care means. And I think there is a huge misconception of that. I think it's why people don't want to talk about it and why a lot of people fear having the conversation about it or why perhaps caregivers don't even really bring it up in all fairness. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't get care. And it doesn't mean that we don't try to um, provide curative options and try to fix things as you're dying. It means that we do both. Um, and people are scared that when someone is deemed palliative, that means now we do nothing, right? If you look at the top model, when it looks at aggressive medical care and then hospice and how there's that sharp divide of you're given information, we're trying to cure and then curative um, isn't possible anymore. And then you're deemed um, hospice care. Um, without that conversation about talking about early access and early conversations about what we need to do to help you as things change and what the future is going to look like is perhaps the, that psychology is the most important thing uh, that we can provide people. Um, and again, it's a balance um, with curative versus palliative and starting to change the focus as things go based on your frailty and based on your level of functioning, what would benefit you as things start to change um, and as time goes on. Um, for a quick example, we just had someone here that was admitted into long-term care at, at Pinecrest um, that was driving three weeks ago uh, that uh, was diagnosed with stage four uh, lymphoma a month ago and has been given a week to live. And I started talking to the family and to the uh, patient about palliative care and what this is gonna mean over the next few days. And they'd never had this conversation before. 
right? So the demise and the grief and the feelings of guilt that they're going through right now are exponential. So how did this fail? And um, wh where did these conversations not uh, take place? By oncology, by the hospital, by their family doctor? I'm not sure, but this is something that when we ignore what's going on, how much more difficult this can be and what the struggle can look like. Um, this is one of my favorite slides because mostly we are a death denying culture. So in general, we don't like to think about or talk about or acknowledge that um, death is an inevitable reality of what is gonna happen. Um, our beliefs about death and dying are further chiseled in our family and our friends and our personal experiences. And I mean, it's a lot to think about and it does cause a lot of anxiety, but we have to understand that death isn't a medical failure. It's a biological certainty. Um, and the struggle is not to, um, um, resist and or fight the, the, the medical system in terms of what cannot be done anymore, but to understand about how we can relieve pain and make things as best as possible. Um, in this slide, I wanted to talk about um, one of the docs that I got to meet in palliative care at a conference, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ted Goddard. Um, every year he goes to um, a Buddhist temple in Southern California and they meditate on on death and dying and, and provide that psychology ongoing for him and his role. Um, and he shared a, really, a lot of good tidbits uh, with me just in terms of helping me understand and prepare people for talking about the future and preparing for um, you know, the things that are gonna happen around us. And one of the things that struck me the most was those, the Buddhist nuns that are coaching people and talking to people that are at these retreats often say the baby is no closer to death than 99 year old. We don't know what's in our future. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen at the end of every day. And that's why it's so important to, to live each day for the fullest um, and to perhaps drink the good scotch. Uh, what are we saving things for? Um, uh, we expect that we don't have to do this until we're quote unquote older or just something happens, but we need to think about this um, because it is normal and we're just trying to naturalize the process. So there are many tools that are at our disposal that we can use to try to predict mortality. Um, but one of the biggest things that we talk about that we often, that you might hear or might hear being asked um, as you're experiencing other people go through, this is the surprise question. So asking someone, which is a clinical validated question, would you be surprised if the person that you knew was gonna pass away within the next 12 months? And often when people are, don't understand about palliative care or the future and say, yes, that's something that they think is possible, it's that acknowledgement um, uh, that's the biggest piece of this psychology that is starting to make people understand that um, we need to make decisions and we need to do things that um, adhere to those patients' values as, as quickly as we can. I'll look at this. If questions come up, we'll talk about the palliative uh, uh, performance scale a little bit later. Um, but what are elements of quality end-of-life care? You know, we all want adequate pain and symptom management. We don't want uh, the prolongation of dying. We want to achieve a sense of control. Um, and we're looking at, you know, what has been the utmost importance of our palliative care um, committee uh, more recently as the options of where can you die? My biggest part of what I've basically been able to do and, and uh, work with with Ontario is I would say less and less being a clinician, but more and more being an advocate. Um, what we're trying to now push uh, forward and the things that we're trying to bring to uh, our hospice and how we can support Kenora is sort of at the forefront of everything that is happening now. And I'll explain that. Um, Let's look at what we thought was unacceptable that in a region as big as ours that we didn't have a palliative care space or a, sorry, a, a hospice space. 
And again, this would be another win or a, um, such an accomplishment, an area of excitement that we do have a dedicated, a dedicated uh, hospice space in Kenora. At the moment with restrictions with COVID, it's closed. Um, but what's important is we're now in front of the Ministry of, of Long-Term Care to now push for from a one bed hospice unit to go to a four bed hospice unit. So what does a four bed hospice unit allow us? Well, our region has, since in the last eight months, have, have, has had 87 referrals to the hospice bed. It's insane, 87 referrals to the hospice bed. How can we accommodate more people and do this better? Well, with doing this um, in Pinecrest in a dedicated unit um, with a dedicated door, um, it's basically the, the space that is the, the biggest thing that is difficult to achieve in rural Ontario. People should be able to die wherever they want. You should, people should be able to die in their own homes. Um, with the lack of human resources of, of uh, home care and just our providers, it makes things more difficult. An option to have a dedicated hospice in a standalone building would be perfect. Um, but how do you coordinate um, to find that space, um, the funding for that ongoing space, to staff that space, to manage that space? It gets harder and harder, and that's why 99% of hospices are co-located in hospitals in our region, which doesn't make sense. So we were able to find and work with Pinecrest to develop hospice in a, a secure and private part of the unit. And if we can achieve a four bed unit in the foreseeable future, and I'm hoping this is weeks away, we could save uh, our healthcare system here over a million dollars a year in the expenses that uh, cost the hospital uh, for a person that stays and occupies uh, their bed. We could also increase our specialized care and support on these units in terms of uh, psychological support, uh, social work, uh, spiritual care. This is just sort of a picture of what one of the um, hospice rooms uh, looks like. And it is an opportunity or a place that we can also help with families when um, avoiding people having medical assistance and dying in the hospital. And sometimes when at home it's too difficult that we're able to support people again um, in the hospice setting this way. So what do most people prefer or what do older adults say, you know, that they want to live with dignity and quality. They want to be prepared for death and dying. They want a place of choice where they can die. Again, pain and symptom management is key and psychological support until the end. How could we plan and what are the biggest things that we need to look at in terms of um, trying to achieve a good death? You know, that's looking at our own values and goals of care and understanding that as things go, asking those questions and, and advocating for, will treatment make a difference as things to begin to change based on our diagnosis? And do those burdens of treatment outweigh its benefits? And if so, what would recovery look like? And that's the biggest thing that I've learned with all of the education and end of life care that I've gotten. So what does CPR look like? What does intubation look like? And what does that mean when perhaps you are living in a vegetative state or you are have end stage uh, con um, congestive obstructive pulmonary disease or maybe end organ heart failure? How does that make you live longer and live better? And what can we do right now to optimize and make that better? There's many hypothetical situations um, that are um, important for everyone to understand that is when this would be a, appropriate for you and what does it mean and how does it change what happens in the future are good discussions to have with your power of attorneys, with your substitute decision makers, with your significant others, with your children in terms of advocating for you of things that you want and things to help you in terms of trying to achieve a peaceful uh, death. Again, the biggest consideration is what are our hopes and expectations as things change and how we um, do this in a very dignified manner. So again, ways to achieve a good death would be naturalizing this process. And what's important is that it's free from suffering 
and again from a needed resuscitation and or hospitalization and having someone there to uh, support you in terms of uh, helping you through all those big decisions is probably one of the biggest things that I do in my role um, here in long-term care and with hospice. Um, so I've covered a ton of slides and I understand that I only had 20 minutes and I was just making sure that I wanted to get the meat and potatoes of things that I covered the most. So I think that takes me to the 21 minute mark, but I just wanted to, I, I mentioned a ton of stuff um, and I wanted to leave it open to any questions or thoughts or ideas or things that, that people uh, had or if anything that, if I've changed um, anything in your thinking or um, notified you of anything that we could possibly do differently in our community. Anyone has questions that can put their hand up or actually if you have one right now, you could probably ask Kelly. Kelly, you're on Kelly, mute. you're still muted. Oh, the joys of Zoom. Um, so by this time in most of our age, we've, we've been a part of somebody's death um, and uh, it's never easy. I just wonder how you deal with, um, because in, in my experience, one in particular experience, I saw that the wishes of uh, the individual who was dying were different than the, the closest family member. And, and how, do you, how do you help deal with that? Because I, what I saw in that situation is the dying person sort of, acquiesced or agreed to what the spouse wanted rather than what what he wanted. So that is the, the probably the most difficult thing that I deal with every day. Um, so I would say that in terms of how important it is that you've got the right people advocating for you and this is this is outlined and clear, it's important that your care provider has that information because it's those, most of the time, those families that are working against what the uh, patient wishes are that achieve a bad death in terms of prolongation and not understanding about the fragility of the future and what makes a difference in terms of adding things that are prolonging life but not necessarily adding quality and the struggle mostly that families go through unless the patient the most palliative care specialists that I talk to say that most palliative care in the end is less the patient and more the family in terms of giving them that support of talking about what is most important and what is realistic and how we can uh, help to achieve that. And unfortunately, sometimes we're not able to achieve that based on um, family wishes um, in terms of just lack of illness understanding. And if I can't get past that point, then unfortunately people do have a very uh, um, tumultuous um, passing. Thank you. I'd just comment on that. My, uh, my experience in palliative care, I found exactly the same thing that it wasn't the physical symptoms that were the biggest, biggest concern or the biggest uh, problem to deal with. It was the emotional and psychological um, acceptance of death. And it's very, very difficult. And one of the things I used to often say, if it was my father's words, um, there's never a right time to die. Um, when you love somebody, when you love somebody, there's never a right time.